Folks, uh, I'd just like to take this opportunity for the main prayer. I see a couple of good people in front of me here this morning. A good friend of mine from Eden's Landing Church many years ago, Pastor Mark Wilson and his dear wife Sue. So good to see your faces again, folks. Uh, 
I'm sure we'll catch up after, but I think you all may know Pastor Mark and, and uh, his wife Sue, a great ambassador for the Lord. Great preaching, my brother. I look forward to hearing you one day very soon. In saying that, folks, uh, we'll just ask you to uh, kneel with me, if you can, as we seek our Lord and Maker in prayer. Our Father in heaven, wonderful and omnipresent Holy Spirit, in addressing thee this morning, Lord, we are addressing the champion of the whole world and the whole universe. Father God, we come boldly and yet humbly before thy throne of grace this morning, seeking mercy and help in time of need. Praying, Lord, for the pouring, outpouring of the Holy Spirit upon this church, upon every individual. Father God, today is a special day. The highlight of every quarter, the commemoration of the Passover, the Last Supper. And what a solemn time in history, Lord, that has been. And Father, we know the story from the supper room to Gethsemane, where our dear Lord, Saviour, Jesus Christ, agonised in prayer, if it be the Father's will that this cup would be taken from him. But alas, it was not meant to be. And there in that scene, Lord, we have the chosen disciples who were to pray with him all night long, but they fell asleep. And yet when confronted, they fled in terror. And then one of his very own, the ultimate betrayal. And there, to the judgment hall of Pilate, an innocent man condemned. And there, to that winding, long winding road to Calvary, where the cross was thrust upon your shoulders. An innocent man that was reviled and mocked and cursed and spat upon and fainted under the weight of the sins of the world, and yet without murmur or complaint. And there on Golgotha Hill, the cross was thrust violently into that hole. Our dear Lord and Saviour felt that terrible agony. And there as he hung suspended in space, a man that had done no wrong, it should have been us, Lord. It should have been us, and yet we are free. And then you cried out, Lord, why God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Because he felt that sin, you dear Lord, you thought that sin was so, so terrible in the sight of God that the Father had left you. And Lord, what a stark reminder that it is for each and every individual that if our time is up and we are lost, that is the same anxiety, the same feeling that we will have that the Lord has truly indeed left us if we leave our run too late. And today, Lord, as we go through the form of worship, may it mean something to us, not a, a form of worship, a ritual, as it so easily and so often can be, but let us get down to the, the true meaning of it and have a real experience with thee, O Father. I pray, Lord, for our speaker this morning, Brother Andrew. Thank you, Lord, for his dedication and his love for this church and the devotion for his office within this uh, church. Bless him, Lord, and his family, and may you speak through him, Lord, as he imparts the words that we need to hear. And I pray, dear God, that for every individual within this church, whatever their lot may be in life or their journey, that they may remember that you have promised them that you'll never leave them nor forsake them. So, dear God, please pour out your blessing upon us now. And at the end of this service, Lord, may we go away saying, it has been good to have spent this day with you. And, Lord, we look truly to that first Sabbath when we spend with you in eternity. And throughout the ceaseless ages of, you, of eternity, Lord, we will ascribe all glory to thee. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. This is the time for the offerings. And Dickens, could you come forward? Therefore, today, the offering goes to the education. And we have two bags, the red and blue bags. 
The red bag is offering for education for today, and the blue bag is for the loan payment. Therefore, you can just put your offering in the right bags. Let us pray. Dear Lord, thank you for your blessings throughout the week. And we came out here today with a tithe and offerings. We we'll return our tithes to you for your ministry and give offerings for those people that we, do, that we can have with this, from this church. Thank you, Lord. Please, please bless the hands that give this tithe and offering to you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Morning, church. Today is a very emotional day because um, we are actually commemorating the the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, and um, it's something for us to really uh, ponder upon and to take notice. And it's also a celebration, as well, if you want to put in those words. Because what Christ did on the cross for us, no man can ever do. My friends, as we draw closer to the end of the year, we, we, we are so thankful for many things. This past year, we've had many baptisms. We've had many people giving their lives to Christ. Some people rededicating their lives to Christ as well. And it's been a great joy. And that says to me that Christ is still working in his church. Christ is still working in the hearts of man. 
And that is something to rejoice about. And we're so grateful and so thankful that his presence is in our lives and his presence is in this church as well. Today, as we participate in, this, in our common bond, which was initiated by Christ in the upper room with the 12 disciples about 2,000 years ago, Christ loved these men so much, though they continually showed him how they couldn't grasp the simple things that he taught. But you see, Christ continued to encourage, he continued to pray for them. However, he chooses to share the last meal with his disciples prior to his arrest and crucifixion. Let us pray. Father God, we just like to thank you, Lord, for this, your Holy Sabbath day. Lord, as we get into your word, we invite your Holy Spirit to be with us. We ask, Lord, that um, you may remove any distractions, Lord, and help us, Lord, focus and zone in into this message this morning because, Lord, I believe you've prepared this message to speak to us directly. Help us, Lord, during this time. In Jesus' holy name I pray. Amen. My friends, this morning I want to bring to your attention a passage that is found in John, the 17th chapter. So I'd like to invite you. Sorry, I don't have PowerPoints this morning. I didn't have a lot of time to do so. Uh, but I'd like for those that have the Bibles, please zone into John chapter 17. John chapter 17. And just hold your thumb there. Uh, and we'll read from John chapter 17 this morning. In this passage, Jesus um, was in deep prayer, and he was also in deep distress as he was about to face the most excruciating ordeal ever faced by mankind. He was going to die on the cross for the sins of this world. He had come to this earth to plead with men so that they could turn away from sin and turn to him and see him as the true son of God. Some seem to realize uh, the need of a savior and others were confounded by their own selfish desires. We then find Jesus, my friends, praying for his disciples that they may be one and also become sanctified in the truth. But most importantly, they need to be sanctified as they go out to the world. He thanks the Father for giving him these men and makes the most profound statement found in verse 14 and 15 and says, I have given them your word. And the world has hated them because they are not of the world. Just as I am not of the world, I do not pray that you should take them out of the world, but you should keep them from the evil one. In other words, my friends, Jesus here is saying that they were once from the world, but now are not of the world. Keep them away from, keep them from the devil as they fulfill your mission. Yes, they will make mistakes, but continue to persevere with them. He goes further and begins in verses 20. This is the highlight of our message, my friends. In verses 20, he says, I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. Verse 21, that they all may be one. You see how he's repeating one word there. What's that one word that's being repeated? One, right? Take note of that word. As you, Father, are in me and I in you, yet that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. And verse 22, and the glory which you gave me, I have given them, that they may be one just as we are one. I in them and you in me, that they may be perfect in one, and, in, and that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them as you have loved me. Verse 24, Father, I desire 
that they also whom you gave me may be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory which you have given me. For you loved me before the foundation of the world. O oh, righteous Father, he says, the world has not known you, but I have known you. And these have known that you sent me, and I have declared to them your name, and will declare it, that the love which you, have, you love me may be in them, and I in them. May the Lord add a blessing to his word. Now, if we look closely, my dear friends, as we get into the heart of our message this morning, as we look closely at this passage, we find Jesus shifts his attention to the church and begins to pray for this church. The same message is being expressed throughout his prayer and about how they need to be one. His burden for these people is for them to be one. My friends, I want to remind you that the ability to win the world or take on the gospel to the world, the church needs to get along. So it is very important that there is unity in the house of God, in the church. Amen? So in objectives, in beliefs, because we are told that union brings strength. This union, my friends, brings weakness to the church. And we're letting God down. So some of us may be asking this morning as to what surrounded this prayer. What was surrounding this prayer? Why would Jesus say this prayer? I want you to, 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 to have your thinking caps on at this moment in time because we're going to get into the word. I won't take too much of your time. I'll be done in 15 minutes if we're lucky. So we want to find out what is surrounding this prayer, right? We will look at the contextual circumstance that surrounded it. If you'd like to turn with me to Luke chapter 22, let's go to Luke chapter 22. Let's turn to Luke chapter 22, my dear friends. Luke, the 22nd chapter, and I want you to zone in on verse 15. Luke 22 beginning from verse 15. Luke 22, beginning from verse 15. And this is what the Bible says. Then he said to, him, to them, with fervent desire, I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. Do you hear that language? God wants to eat his last meal with those men. Because why? He has compassion and he has love for them. But we can also see that he is down to his last hours and down to the last hours with his church. And at least what he wants is to have a peace of mind. He wants to have peace of mind because this is his last hours before he gets crucified on the cross. But instead... Let's read verse 21 and 22. Let's zone into verse 21 and verse 22. It says, But behold, the hand of my betrayer is with me on the table. Verse 22, And truly the Son of Man goes as it has been determined, but woe to that man by whom he is betrayed. My friends, Jesus Christ here, He's sitting at the Last Supper. He's sitting at the Last Supper, and he's sitting with his betrayer. For those that, for those of us who have read other sources, we know that Judas Iscariot was a very brilliant man. He was a very sharp man. And Judas Iscariot had one desire. Ellen White says that this, young, this man loved Jesus so much. He loved Jesus so much, but there was one thing, 
one thing that he held on to for so long. He had the love for mammon. Because other sources tell me that he believed in the teachings of Jesus far much greater than he had ever heard. And this man, we are even told that he volunteered his service. Jesus didn't choose him. He volunteers his service, and because of Jesus' love and compassion for men, he brought him closer. Because that's what Jesus does. Because Jesus cares for all men. But Judas' lack of humility caused him to betray Jesus. We're even told in the book of John that Jesus is now sitting with his 12 disciples on, the, on, on, on that table. And they begin to talk and he says, one of you will betray me. One of you will betray me. And he takes the bread and passes it to, G to, to Judas. And Jesus says to him, do whatever thou do, do it quickly. But at that moment in time, the disciples still couldn't understand or grasp what was taking place. My friends, you would think that was enough for Jesus before this prayer in John 17. You thought that that was enough for him. But let's zone into verse 24. Let's zone into verse 24 with me, my friends. Now there was also a dispute among them as to which of them should be considered the greatest. Do you see what Jesus is experiencing or going, going through right now? He is about to be crucified for them, but where, is their, where are their minds? Far from him. Now they're disputing who is going to be the greatest in the kingdom. Hold on for a minute. What kingdom were they referring to? The earthly kingdom. Christ didn't come to establish the earthly kingdom. But Jesus is having to deal with this. My friends, their minds at this moment in time were still clouded by the things of the flesh. This was sickening to Jesus as the church that he loved so much, so dearly, could not see what was more important. They were lacking with the basics of just getting along. The basics of just getting along. Christ came to save them from their sin and establish a place for them in heaven. That was the reason why Christ came. If you continue with me a few more verses, verse 31 and 32, it says, And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, indeed Satan has asked for you, that ye may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith should not fail. And when you have returned to me, strengthen your brethren. My friends, Christ had made an emphasis on Peter's name because Satan, remember, Satan had got a hold of Judas. And he wanted to warn Peter that Satan was after you. But Jesus says to him, I have prayed for you. Because that is what Jesus is all about. Jesus is all about his people, his children. As we look at this a little closer, closely, my friend, we find that Jesus is having to deal with all these things before he dies. And then we find in the book of Matthew 25, verse 46, we find that Jesus... His disciples, all of them, betrayed him. All of them looked the other way. They forsook him because their minds were fixed on the wrong things. You know, the interesting thing about God is that he tends to describe his church in the way he wants it to be. He tends to describe this church in the way that he wants it to be. 
He wants them to be a peaceful and a loving church. But the people of God are messed up and mixed up. But with enough sense, they will bring their problems to Jesus Christ. Because no one is perfect here. We're all broken vessels. But Jesus wants us to bring our stuff to the cross. So God knows what he's working with. He is working with a variety of people in various degrees of salvation. He is patient, long-suffering, and kind. He desire, his desire is for us as his children to be kind and to be in the kingdom of heaven with him. My beloved, the thing that makes the church one is our oneness and our need for Jesus Christ. The thing that makes us one is our corporate understanding that we are all sinners that are saved by grace. So Jesus is praying this prayer to the church. He's asking for unity and love to resound in the hearts of men. When we become one in Christ, the world will believe in Christ Jesus. Disunion brings about Lack of power. If we need power in our lives, let's move on. Let's find out what we need to do when we need power in our lives. When we become one in Christ, the world will believe in Christ Jesus. They will not see, but will see Christ in us, the hope of glory. We, we, we can obviously say that we live in a hostile world, but Christ wants us to learn to live with each other because it is only through faith we are united in him. Believers across the ages, we are told that have yearned for a new community. Jesus described to his disciples in the upper room. We long for the loving relationship, the humility expressed in foot washing that we're about to do, the deep express, experience of Jesus' uh, presence, the sense of remaining in him. My friends, as we come to this place of worship and participate in our communion, in our com common bond, the world's principles stand in dark contrast to divine righteousness and godly life. So now the time has come for Christ to die on the cross. As he's carrying that cross, I can only imagine the thoughts that are going through his mind. That these same very people I came to save are treating me like this. But my friends, he had to be faithful to the cross because the glory that he gave to the church referred to the glory on the cross. And as a church, my friends, and as a church acknowledges him dying on the cross, we will become united in his purpose. So the arguing, so the arguing, the hatred, the backbiting, and the fault finding to gain popularity by putting others down, we set aside and focus on the mission to tell others about the love of Christ. This was the prayer Jesus prayed in John chapter 17. So my friends, this morning as we draw this to a close, God is asking that we love because if we cannot love God, cannot use us to the best of our ability. If you look at Matthew chapter 5, where Jesus is talking, Matthew chapter 5, verse 43, you don't have to turn there. I'll read in your hearing. It says, you have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. Amen? But I say to you, Jesus is talking, love your enemies Bless those who curse you. Do good to those who hate you. And pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. So what does that mean, my friends? If you have someone in this church who said something about you in the nominating committee, love them. 
Because that's what Jesus is saying. If someone said something about your child or your marriage, pray for them and love them. Because that's what Jesus said, right? Wherever people are, 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 are together, like this church, people are going to. They're going to come up with all sorts of things. But what do we need to be? The bigger person. And continue to persevere for the goal. And what is that goal? To reach Calvary. But the Bible tells us that bless them, those that persecute you. Love them. Verse 45, that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. For he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. My friends, Jesus is saying, you haven't arrived to the kingdom of grace if you can only get along with people that you get along with. You haven't arrived. You need to get along with everybody. We need to go the extra mile and get along with everyone. And it can only be done through grace. My friends, what will, what will get us in glory is transformation of character through Christ. That allows you to start pu putting practice on everyday basis the principles of God's law. My friends, the greatest proof of grace in church is gracious people. Gracious people. Did we hear that? The greatest evidence that you are growing in grace is that you become gracious toward every broken person around you. You be it in church or a non-church member. So if you have people so wrapped up in sin having the courage to walk through that door and sit next to you or sit down on the pews. They're just coming to sit down on the pews with the hypocrites that are in here already. Who are you to judge? I remember a story. There's a lady who had come to church one time and um, she wasn't addressed for church, you know? She wasn't dressed for church because she wasn't from church. And then we had a, a group of people who were watchdogs. In every church, you got watchdogs, right? Those that are watching for something, yeah? They came, she came in, and she sat down. And those people, those same people came and approached her and said to her, do you need something to cover up? Because this is not how we dress here. Do you think that person ever came back to church? My friends, what I'm saying is we need to be careful how we deal with each other. John 17, Jesus was praying for these same very things. As we conclude this morning, my friends, I hope and pray that I did not come across too blunt. But I'm thinking that to myself that we are wasting a lot of time, a lot of energy on things that don't pertain to the, heaven, to the heavenly kingdom. God wants us to be united. Not united in the sense of compromise. No, 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 that's not what I'm saying. Or I might have some people trying to talk to me later on. That's not what I'm saying. Unity in beliefs. Unity in the word of God. Because I want you to remember these few things that I'm about to say. The world. You know what the world is watching to see? The world is looking for the gratification at the disunion amongst the Christians. That's what the world is looking at. 
If you're not united, the world is rejoicing. You see, I told you about those Christians. So as we participate in our communion service this morning, think about all the things that I've said or things that are going in your life. Bring them to the foot of the cross. Because we live in a life where we have a redeemer. And that redeemer is Jesus Christ. Because my friends, union with Christ and with one another it is our only safety in these last days. That's the only safety we have. And as, I, as we conclude, before we pray, I just wanted to share this one thing. My friends, as I said to you, as we, you've probably all, all, all heard this phrase that a church is a hospital. In a hospital, do you have people who are not sick. We have sick people, right? So if Darren Jones, my brother there, is diagnosed with cancer, when does he have time to worry about what brother Bill, who is diagnosed with something else, when does he have time for that? You have no time, right? My friends, let us put our, our focus in the right place. Let us put our focus and trust in the word of God. Let, the problem is we're wasting so much energy and time on each other. And we're missing the point. Remember what happened to the disciples? As Jesus was praying for them, he prayed for them. But you see, Judas was gone too far. But he prayed for them. And when they, when they realized who Jesus was, they started the first church, Acts chapter 11. They had power. 3,000 people were baptized. We want to have power in our community, in our lives. Let's put our trust in him. And let us focus on the right things. May the Lord add a blessing to his message. Okay, uh, now we're going to um, split uh, and uh, before we have our communion service, we're going to have our food washing service. So uh, in the youth room, we're going to have the couples in there. And then in the rooms on the hallway, uh, we're going to have the men in there. And then in the hall, we are going to have the, the women. And uh, we're going to have the children's story uh, right about now. Thank you. All right, boys and girls. Hello, everyone. How are you? Are you all on holidays? Who's on holidays here? I am. Oh, fantastic. So everyone who goes to school is on holidays, and I'm a teacher, so I get to go on holidays too, which is good. You're at school too? What grade are you in? And you too? I'm in kindergarten. Kindergarten? Wow, you're a big girl, aren't you? Fantastic. Well, I'm going to tell a story, but I need someone who's a little bit strong. I need a helper. So can I have one of you, maybe one of you boys, would you like to be a helper for me? You've got to carry this bag for me. You see that big bag there? Would you like to be my helper? It's a big bag, isn't it? Which you have to stand up for it though. Okay, all right, here we go. What we're going to do is we're going to put that on your, back, on your back. So there you go. Oh, excellent. Hey, that, you're pretty strong. Let me just tie that up. All right, where's my helper? You disappeared on me. Uh, would someone else like to be a helper? Okay, come on up. There we go. 
All right. Now, what you have to do is you have to stand there for me, and you're not allowed to move, all right? Because you're going to be my helper. This, this is a special person, and her name is Davina, okay? And, you know, Davina decided to take a nice, big, long journey, and she likes bushwalking. You like bushwalking, Davina? She's not sure. <laughs> she, yep, for sure. She loves bushwalking. And what she decided to do was she was going to find a big canyon called the Cliffs of Success. Ooh, that sounds very exciting, doesn't it? So she packed up her bag. See, there it is. You see her bag? Turn around, show everyone your bag. Yep. And it was pretty light, wasn't it? See how nice and light it is? And then she set off on her way. So off she goes walking. So as Davina walked along, she whistled and enjoyed the view until she came to a small hut on the side of the pathway out in the bush. Uh, now Davina called out, hello. Hello. And nobody answered. She looked all around. And on the table in the hut, there was a great big loaf of bread. Now, she was a bit hungry. Are you hungry? Yep. She's starving. Yes. Yes, look at her. She's hungry, very hungry. And there was a big jug of water as well. And when she called out hello, nobody had answered. So where do you think that person had gone? Maybe they'd gone down for a, maybe a walk or they've gone to wash their hair or something like that. So what she did is she went, oh, I'm so hungry and nobody's answered me. So what she did is she got that bread. She picked it up quickly. She popped it in her backpack and off she ran, walking down the pathway. Oh, she felt a little bit guilty. Uh-oh. And she started to feel like maybe she'd done something wrong. Do you know what? The bag that she was wearing started to feel heavier. Does that feel heavier, Davina? Yes. Uh-oh. It's getting really heavy. All right. So that didn't matter, though. She just went, oh, it's a bit uncomfortable, but she's, she kept walking. So she hadn't paid any money for that. She was feeling a bit bit naughty about that but anyway after a while Davina ate the loaf of bread and she thought I'll just keep going anyway as she kept walking she crossed a bridge and a man was sitting there drinking some lemonade <gasps> yum and eating do you know what he was eating chocolate, chocolate cake you're right who here likes chocolate cake me too. Oh, I love chocolate cake. You too? Fantastic. Well, do you know what? Most kids, when they have one, well, most adults, when they have a, some chocolate cake, they'll just take one piece, won't they? Do you know what Davina did? How many pieces do you think she took? Whole pack. The whole lot? I think so. That's what she did. She got the cake and she ate one piece. <laughs> And then she got another one. Oh, she was just loving it. And she's eating. My, how many pieces of cake has she had now? I think she's going to have another one. Half the cake is already gone. You're a little bit greedy, aren't you? Uh-oh. She just kept eating. She had some more lemonade, some more chocolate cake. And before long, her tummy was just like, oh, full. She was just so full. Well, that was a little bit greedy, wasn't it? She felt a little bit bad about how much of the cake that she ate because when the man turned around, he goes, oh, where, where's my cake? And Davina said, uh, um, thank you, it was delicious. And she felt a little bit bad. You know, when she felt a little bit bad, come over here, I'm going to put something else in your bag. It's pretty heavy. Oh, how's that going, Davina? Is that pretty heavy? Yes. Okay. How's your muscles at the back? Are you surviving? You think you can hold it a bit longer? Oh, okay. Well, she's going to keep going. She's going to try. The next thing, she walked along, and guess what she saw? A great big golden gate. And 
it said on the golden gate, it said, bow to the golden gate. Now, just through the golden gate, she could see that there was this really big, beautiful house. And inside the beautiful house, there was lots of beautiful furniture and lots of lovely food and lots of all sorts of lovely things inside, money and gold and all sorts of things. She wanted to go in there, didn't she? And she thought, you know what? I would really like to go in there. So I think what I'll do is I'll just bow down. So she bowed down to the golden gate and all of a sudden the gate opened. And off she went through it. And she went into the house. And there were so many beautiful things. But you know what? There was no one there. No one at all. And she was terribly lonely and she felt kind of empty inside. Of course, she knew that she wasn't supposed to bow down to anything. Wasn't supposed to bow down to gold or to anything else. And it was really funny because when she was walking around the house, her bag started feeling heavier. Uh Uh-oh. Here we go. Here comes another one. Oh, how are we going, Zabina? How's the muscles? Bad. Uh oh. It's getting heavier and heavier and heavier. Not good. Okay, well, because she had that empty feeling in her heart, she thought that she might turn around and retrace her steps and find the original pathway. And when she, when she went to the pathway, she saw a man standing there. And you know, that man, his name was Evangelist. And his name was, that's a funny name for a man, isn't it? Evangelist. And he said to her, where are you going? Well, said Davina, oh, that was so uncomfortable. I'm going to the cliffs of success. But, you know, it's really hard work because I've got this great big backpack on and it's getting so heavy and it makes me feel terrible. Well, that's... That's not very good, said the evangelist. Why don't you skip the cliffs of success and why don't you go straight to an amazing place that I've seen and it's called the Celestial City. Wow, it's gorgeous. It's much more satisfying. But you know what? There's only one way to get there. You need a guide. And Davina, his name is Jesus. Wow. As they talked... Davina felt her heart lift. A guide would be so helpful and so useful. So she listened to Evangelist describe him as he felt a, as she felt a strong desire to meet this Jesus, this guide. So Evangelist led her up to a hill, and on that hill was a cross, and that was where she met Jesus. As she spoke to Jesus and asked him to guide his, him to guide her way, she suddenly felt her backpack lighten. All those burdens of guilt and sin and shame were taken off her. Because do you know what Jesus did? Here it comes. Okay. Oh. Jesus took everything off her, all the sin, all the guilt, all the shame. Does that feel a bit lighter now, Davina? Certainly. (laughs) I think she's a lot happier, isn't she? Did he take her off her clothes? Oh, no, he didn't take her clothes off. He He just took the big bag of all of that heavy stuff. So as they talked, she felt her heart lift. And she could see that Jesus had actually taken off that bag of sin off her and everything. She felt really light and free now. So from that day, the path seemed really sure. And when they walked along, Jesus took all of the heavy stuff for her and all she had to do was just walk along. She felt like all her burdens are gone. That was pretty good, wasn't it? It wasn't long before they got to the celestial city and Jesus opened the gate with his key. And they walked in and Davina knew that she um, would never have made it without Jesus and along such a dangerous road. So boys and girls, 
Davina is just like you and me. And this backpack is all the guilt we feel when we have sin in our lives. But you know what? Jesus takes all of that because he died on the cross for us. And he frees us from that great big weight. So we must be thankful for God's care. Um, and remember that one day, all of us are going to be able to go to the celestial city too. Would you like to go there? It's very beautiful. And Jesus is going to be there too. And he's even better. All right, boys and girls, you can go back to your seats now. It's really lovely to have you here today. Thank you. Okay, uh, now as we get into our next segment uh, for communion service, I just want us to reflect on, on the symbols that we have before us. Um, do symbols reflect uh, the body of Christ and the blood of Christ dying on the cross, shedding his blood for us and reconciliating us with, with the Father in heaven? And it is our duty to live by faith and to trust in him. So at this moment in time, I'd just like to invite you to close your eyes as we open up. Father, we thank you, Lord. Now as we enter into our next segment, Lord, we ask for your Holy Spirit to be a part of us. Lord, as we commemorate this service, Lord, and um, we just ask, Lord, that we may bring everything to the foot of the cross. S sinful beings, Lord, we are. We ask, Lord, that we may humble ourselves on a day-to-day -day basis. That we may give our lives and our hearts to you. And make this journey a reality in our lives. We thank you, Father, as I pray this in, holy, in your holy name. Amen. Let us pray for bread and wine. Dear Lord, at this moment we sacrifice your flesh and, and your blood. In this Christmas time, we remember your coming into the world to save us from our sins. And from this communion, we remember your sacrifice giving your body and blood shed for us to cleanse us from sin. And from this blood, we can also anticipate your second coming. When you drink with these wines, let us remember your sacrifice, your holy blood coming to us, just so we can resemble your life and your love and your character in helping other people and giving the gospel and bringing the gospel and good news to the people around us. Thank you, Lord, for being with us and setting these ceremonies that we can remember you and resemble you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Likewise, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This is the cup, the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you. Yo sé 
Father, we thank you, Lord. Now, as, we, as the song says, go forth, go forth, Lord. We ask, Lord, for your leading, and we ask for your Holy Spirit. Help us, Lord, to live, continue to live by faith and to reflect on Calvary on a day-to-day -day basis. Father, we thank you, Lord, for your grace that endureth forever. We thank you, Lord, for your love that you have for us and um, that you have for the dying world. Empower us, equip us, Lord, as we go forth to proclaim your good news. As we pray this in Jesus' holy name, amen.